that will help prepare for future leadership. We're going to talk more about that a little bit tonight. Um, tonight we'll be covering, uh, the topic is mirroring Christ. But before we get there, let's open with prayer. We'll do a quick review of last week and finish up what we didn't finish last week and then segue in. And this will be it. So, all right, let's pray. Father, we do thank you for your guidance. Father, I just thank you for uh, the words, the outline, the series that you gave me, Father God. I pray that I have done it justice in delivering it as you intended I pray, Lord God, that it will find fertile soil in the hearts of each one that has participated. And Father, that each one would find that growth measure in their lives and their spiritual walk with you and in their ability to lead with confidence and under your power and your guidance. And so, Lord, as we talk about that more tonight, we just pray that you would lead us, that you would accomplish that which you desire. Father, that we would honor you as we read your word. And, Father, that we would put these things into practice in a conscious way, Father God, that we would be purposeful in all that we do in our leadership. We thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 All right. Um, Okay. Tonight, uh, for those of you, if you want to turn back to Section 5 of your outline, we're just going to do a quick summation here of what we covered. Uh, We talked about what it takes to be... Uh, strong and perseverant uh, in our leadership and in our faith walk because we know that the further we go along, the more we lead, the more we do to honor Christ and glorify Him, the more we're going to be met with opposition, persecution, um, hardship, and the like. So we're going to talk more tonight about that. But one of the things we talked about last week was learning to strengthen in advance For those of you who were here, help us out. How do we do that? Two particular ways. Devotions, in other words, prayer and reading the word, making that a conscious effort every day that we know Christ. What? There it is, Sabbath day, day of rest. We will grow weary and we will be less effective if we don't take that one day a week to be refreshed. God himself, the almighty of almighties, took a day of rest. So if we think we don't have to, we're setting ourselves up before God. Whoever thought about that? Okay, so he gave us this Sabbath rest for a reason. And that is a great time to go even deeper in your devotion that day, your prayer life that day. I mean, I hope that we're doing our everyday morning, whether it's 10 minutes, 20 minutes, or an hour, hopefully up to an hour, But on these days of Sabbath rest, it's a great time to spend that time before God and just soak in what he's speaking as well as praising him. And then um, also, you know, even a Sabbath day is unto the Lord. That could actually work into your 16 hours a week that we started out with looking to do. Um, We also talked about that if we're going to muscle through the hard times and muscle through those times when we don't feel like being a leader. We don't feel like putting that smile on our face. We don't feel like uh, being those servants, uh, leaders that he's called us to be. We have to learn that if we strengthen in advance, we can call upon his strength and not our own, which we should be doing anyway. We shouldn't really be doing anything out of our own strength. You know, I mean, yeah, you can be a parent. Yeah, you can be, uh, you know, You can mop floors, you can scrub toilets, and you might not feel like you need a lot of confidence in Christ. But I guarantee you, if you put in these 16 and a half hours a week that we talked about, you're going to be, I don't care what you're doing, you're going to start to feel like you need that confidence in Christ to give you the strength to work everything for good as seen in Romans 8, 28. For those who love him, walk according to their call and purpose. He promises in his word to work it all for good. So even when it doesn't feel good, doesn't seem good, it seems like everything's going wrong, we can put our confidence in this promise, okay? And in that, we learn to depend on his strength because his grace, his power, unmerited favor, love, power, is sufficient for everything that we deal with, whether we're in our um, daily walk, whether it's teaching a class, whatever it is, in our weakness, he is made strong. 
So Paul says, I rejoice in my weakness because he is made strong in my weakness. In other words, when we depend on him, we glorify him. Okay, the other thing is staying in that grace flow. Okay, who knows how to stay in the grace flow? We've talked about that a good bit throughout this whole series. What's necessary to be in the flow of grace, the full flow? Obedience, Obedience. good. What else? Grace, Grace. okay. Yeah, we need his power to to receive his power. Um, What about... Repentance. We talked about having a clean heart. We talked about walking in obedience and right standing with God. If we're not in that place, then he doesn't move, we move. Every time we're walking in sin, every time we're walking in complaint, every time that we're not giving in to his strength and depending on him, then we're not walking in the full grace flow. So we need to make sure that we stay in that grace flow. And then uh, we talked about persevering under duress and we talked about Paul we read his stuff last week about how many things had happened to him in his mission trips his ministry shipwreck bitten by a viper beaten flogged you name it I mean imprisoned all kinds of things and yet he continued to persevere how does he do that Exactly, exactly. It brings you right back here. Huh? Yeah. Stayed with the Lord and he kept his eyes, his focus upon the Lord and his purpose rather than what was happening to him, which kind of took us into that discussion of pigeonholing our human side at times, pigeonholing our emotions at times in order to do what God's called us to do. Now, when I talk about pigeonholing, does anybody remember what not to do in that? Don't just leave it there. Don't leave it in the hole. That's right. We're not shoving it down and leaving it. We're setting it aside in order to walk in God's anointing and his grace to do what he's purposed us to do. But at some point, we've got to go back and revisit those emotions. But what do we do? Do we let those emotions drive us and lead us? No. What do we do with them? We deal with them. Yeah, we deal with them. If we can't get rid of negative emotions on our own, we definitely need to be bringing those before God. So pigeonholing just means setting it over here in the mailbox until we have time to open the mail in front of God. Okay? So all of this is how we depend on Him to bring forth in us more than we can bring forth out of ourselves. I don't care how good you are, how strong you are, Whatever you might think you are as a leader, a man, a woman, you still need God in order to do God's work. He designed it that way. Okay, now, that's where we left off, okay? Tonight, we're going to finish up on the bottom part of that outline where it talks about being led by the Spirit and uh, and truth. We kind of jumped into that a little bit, um, and then we're going to talk about... Uh, the Holy Spirit guiding us, leaning on one another, and accepting God's discipline, which is going to segue right into this part of mirroring Christ. So we got a lot to accomplish tonight in order to finish up. So if I get to going too fast, just stop me, and uh, we'll make it work. Okay, so if you've got your Bibles, you can turn with me to 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5. We'll start there. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do you not realize that Christ Jesus is in you? Unless, of course, you fail the test, and I trust that you will discover that we have not failed the test. Now we pray to God that you will not do anything wrong, not that the people will, sorry, not that people will see that we have stood the test, but that you will do what is right, even though we may seem to have failed. For we cannot do anything, this is the key sentence, we cannot do anything against the truth, but only for the truth. Okay, so how do you examine yourself? How do you test to see if you're in the faith, as he's putting it? So that we know that we're being led by the truth. Yes. 
Yes. How well do you know God's word and how well are you measuring up against the standard or the example that he set before us? Okay. It's not how I measure up to Elizabeth or how Elizabeth measures up to Kristen or Kristen measures up to Avery. This is all about how do I, each of us, measure up to Christ? How do we know that if we don't know who Christ is? We have to know who he is, his character, his nature, his ministry style. Um, everything about him should be in our minds and in our hearts so that we can become those imitators. And that's what we have to test. We, it's not enough to ask yourself, am I Christ-like? Although most of us, if we're honest, will go, no, not quite. Okay. But I'm trying and I'm growing. That's a test. But then as you measure against Christ in the word, Knowing that you're not going to measure up, what do you need to work on? What do you need to change? We all should have those places in our lives that need to change. If we're honest with ourselves, none of us have arrived. None of, the, none of us is, are without fault, without sin, okay? It says those who say they're without sin, they are liars. How does God feel about liars? He does not like them. In fact, he detests them. And in the Old Testament, it says liars will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Okay, so if we're lying to ourselves, that's still lying. And if we're trying to pretend that we have no fault, we are liars. Okay, now, that being said, what do we do when we find ourselves in that situation? Well, okay, let's say I find a weakness in me that I'm having difficulty overcoming, okay, this truth that I'm supposed to be living by hasn't exactly took hold completely. What do I do with that? That information, that knowledge. Pray about it. Pray about it. Confess it. Repent. What if that doesn't work? Sometimes we have what I call besetting sins where you can pray, 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 and that thing keeps sneaking up on you, sneaking up on you, and coming back on you, and you find that you are too weak to overcome it. Lean on one another. Yes. And I could spend all night just on this section, but I won't. Um, so we're going to get there in just a second. Hold on to that thought. All right. Now, looking at John 16, if you want to flip with me. You don't have to because some of these are short. Okay. John 16, verse 13 says, But when he, the spirit of truth, comes... He will guide you into all truth. He will not speak on his own. He will speak only what he hears, and he will tell you what is yet to come. He will bring glory to me by taking from what is mine, this is Jesus talking, and making it known to you. All that belongs to the Father is mine. That is why I said the Spirit will take from what is mine and make it known to you. Okay, so... We have two things here. We're pursuing truth. We have the guidance, the counsel, the, gu the direction of the Holy Spirit within us to tell us what the Father wants from us, right? What Jesus would have us do. So, you know, think back to the, uh, what was it, the 90s, early 2000, where we had the WWD, JD, yeah, WWJD. What would Jesus do? Okay, so you have the Holy Spirit to go to. Okay, but then sometimes if we're lying to ourselves or we don't like what the Spirit's saying, we can still go, mm, I'm not sure, I don't hear, I don't know if I'm really walking in the truth or not. Okay, that's when we go back to what Patrick just said, which is about leaning on one another. So we're going to use a couple of passages here to talk about what that looks like. So Jimmy's fixing to read to us, since we didn't let him read last week, 1 Thessalonians 5. Verses 11 through 24. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. And then for final instruction, starting at 12. Now we ask you, brothers and sisters, to acknowledge those who work hard among you, who care for you in the Lord, and who admonish you. Hold them in the highest regard. Oops. Because of their work, live in peace with each other. We urge you, brothers and sisters, warn those who are idle and disruptive, encourage the disheartened, help the weak, be patient with everyone. 
Make sure that nobody pays back wrong for wrong, but always strive to do what is good for each other and for everyone else. Rejoice always. Pray continually. <laughs> Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Jesus Christ. Do not quench the spirit. Do not treat prophecies with contempt, but test them all and hold on to what is good. Reject every kind of evil. May God himself, the God of peace, sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless as the com at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The one who calls you is faithful, and he will do it. Brothers and sisters, pray for us. Greet all of God's people with a holy kiss. I charge you before the Lord to have this letter read to all the brothers and sisters. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Amen. Okay, what would happen if we did all of those things? And I still didn't get them all down. Okay. <laughs> and wouldn't we all be one step closer to God and we would be more in union with each other? That unity would persevere in the body of Christ because we're all encouraging each other. We're all acknowledging the work, the good work that each one's doing, which means we show appreciation for what people do. We hold each other in high regard rather than bad-mouthing behind the scenes. We seek peace with each other. We warn each other. Okay, what do we warn each other about? Missteps, Missteps sin, waywardness, whatever it might be. All right, we deal with each other with patience. We do good unto each other. We rejoice in what we have been given. We pray. We give thanks. That's a huge one. That always keeps our attitude intact if we give thanks to God for what is good. And ultimately, we got to ask, are we? Ask this question. This is a hard question to ask yourself. Am I part of what's quenching the Holy Spirit in a church? If we're crying out for a move of God, we're crying out for revival, we're crying out to see this wind of the Holy Spirit blow through this place and change us all, what's standing in the way? Us, okay? Now, you can say it's us as a body. Maybe that's true. I don't really see that a whole lot. But what about if we said, am I part of the problem? Am I quenching the spirit with gossip? Am I quenching the spirit with uh, bad attitude, jealousy, envy, whatever it might be? So this is a key question that we can ask ourselves. And then if we're really brave, we would ask each other. Somebody that you know will speak the truth in love, led by the Holy Spirit, do you see, what do you see in me that quenches the spirit of God, that causes you to feel negative or causes you to feel discouraged or causes you to shrink back from being all that you can be in Christ? That's a hard question, but it's a key question if we're ever going to hit revival, okay? Now, if you ask that before God, my guess is God will tell you exactly what you do that keeps him from moving as powerfully as I know he wants to move. Okay? If he tells you that, what should you do with that? Well, one, you should repent. Two, try to change it. Three, you may need an accountability partner to help you change it. Okay? That's where we have to have that confidant, that accountability person that we can go to and say, I am really struggling with this particular thing. I feel like I'm thwarting a move of the Spirit. I don't want to be in the way of what God wants to do in this body. And so help me to be better. That's called leaning on each other. Okay? Now, if we did that, we would be more confident in confessing our sins to one another and asking for help. In fact, James 5, 16 reminds us that we should confess our sins to one another and that we should ask for prayer. If we ask for prayer, okay, then he says, let the elders lay hands. 
Let them pray over you. Let your confidant, let your pastor, let your friend, your wife, your husband, whomever can pray over you. Anybody can pray for you, okay? Let them pray for you that you would be strengthened in whatever it is that you're trying to overcome. If you're going through a hard time and your faith is weak, that's the perfect time to go, y'all, I'm not doing so good. I need help. The enemy's beating me up or I'm falling away so that that person not only hears your confession because in that confession, it brings it into the light, okay? In the darkness, the enemy keeps on whittling away at you. In the light, we're inviting the power of the Holy Spirit into it, bringing it forth in truth and light and love and saying, I need somebody to pray for me. I need somebody to hold me accountable. And that is a powerful, powerful tool, powerful weapon, okay? So that's the first thing we should be doing. It also says in 1 Corinthians 1, uh, 3 through 7, that we should comfort one another. With the same comfort that we've been given, we are to comfort each other, comfort others, okay? Now, how many of you have ever received comfort from anybody in the church? Most of us, yeah. How many of you ever experienced comfort from God, from the Holy Spirit? Yeah, hopefully everybody here. Okay, so if we've received that from the Holy Spirit and we've received that through our fellow believers, what we've received, we should be able to dispense to others in the body. Okay, so think of yourself as a little Pez dispenser. You're getting filled up with candy, you're spitting it back out. Get filled up with candy, spit it back out. Okay, so uh, we are dispensing that comfort and that encouragement. Uh, when we talk about, we talked about this briefly a few weeks ago, when we have a confidant or a prayer partner or accountability partner, whatever you want to call it, what are the boundaries or parameters of that relationship? Who should you pick? Yes, ideally someone that's further along than you are, okay? At the very least, make sure it's somebody that's at least where you are, okay? You don't want to go release all your junk to someone who may not be as mature as you in the faith. Why? They're not going to know how to deal with it. And sadly, you may cause them to stumble, Okay, as you pour out and somebody says, oh, well, this and this, and then they go, wow, if this person who is supposed to be more spiritually mature than I is struggling with this, or they fell into this sin, or they are doing that, then, you know, if they can do it, I guess I can do it. Okay, or it may just be that you're so negative that they're going, wow, that's a negative person. If that's what a Christian looks like, do I really want to be a Christian? That happens, okay? So we got to be careful of what the listener is hearing and how they're responding to what we say. So we want to make sure that it's somebody that understands what should be changing and being transformed within us and how that occurs, okay? So we want to go equal or above. Does that make sense? Okay. Now, that takes us segued right into as we're looking and leaning on one another, okay, then we have to learn to not only grow and be transformed into the likeness of Christ, we have to start truly reflecting Christ. And that's the mirroring Christ part that we get in on the last page tonight. Um, that being said, I'm going to ask Patrick to read from Hebrews 12, verses 1 through 11, because this is a great segue on what we're talking about. Therefore, since we have... We also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us. Let us lay aside every hindrance and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith. For the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility from senators against himself, so that you won't grow weary and give up. In struggling against sin, you have not yet resisted to the point of shedding your blood. And you have forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons. My son, do not take the Lord's discipline lightly or lose heart when you are reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves 
and punishes every son he receives. Endure suffering as disciples. God is dealing with you as sons. For what son is there that a father does not discipline? But if you are without discipline, which all receive, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Furthermore, we had human fathers discipline us, and we respected them. Shouldn't we submit even more to the Father of Spirits and live? For they disciplined us for a short time based on what seemed good to them, but he does it for our benefit so that we can share his holiness. No discipline seems enjoyable at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Amen. Powerful, powerful passage there for those of us who feel that we are constantly enduring hardship or suffering or obstacles or persecution or whatever it is that you feel like the enemy is coming against you to thwart you becoming uh, everything that you desire to be in the name of Jesus, okay? But in fact, it says God allows this discipline. And what is our discipline? What is discipline from God look like? What does it look like? Not what is it? What does it look like? Hardship. But give me some specifics that you might that the people in this body might recognize as hardship. Because we're not under persecution the way the Christians were in the days of Rome in the New Testament, right? But we still have hardship. What kind of suffering or hardship do we endure? Bills? Meh. (laughs) A lot of that's self-imposed. Okay. (laughs) Do what? Yes. Lack of... (laughs) Resources, we'll say. Um, I add that to famine, (laughs) starvation. Um, Yeah, no lights, no water, whatever you can't pay for. Um, Sleepless nights. Sleepless nights, yes. (laughs) Sleepless. Okay. Strife, yes. Well, the, the thing is, whatever causes the strife certainly becomes a hardship because what does it do to us? Raises our blood pressure, creates stress, pain, very much so, yes. Stress, pain, heartache. Or a physical ache, yeah. Anything else you can think of? Sickness, for instance. Loss, yes, grief. That does what? Yes. Difficult people. <laughs> That's putting it nicely, right? <laughs> Notice he didn't look at anybody in here. Okay. Jackie, did you have one? Real warfare, like the, the bus driver saying, you know, uh, uh, folks around there, I mean, every time somebody struck us around there, every side. Surrounded on every side in spiritual warfare, yes. You're not good enough, you're not worthy, you're not loved, whatever lie he wants to tell you, right? All right. That's a pretty good list right there. All right, so all that being said, if God is allowing... First of all, we got to say the devil only has power that either we give him or God gives him. He has no power on his own anymore because he's defeated at the cross. So God's allowing him to rule and reign on the earth, right? And because we live in this fallen world where he rules and reigns, all these things come against us. Now, some of this, like Avery was saying, we might invite some strife, okay? And then we deal with the consequences of that, the stress, the pain, whatever. Sometimes we don't invite it. It just comes upon us because of those difficult people that Clay was talking about, okay? Sometimes we have lack of resources, no funds. But what does God tell us about that? What about our needs not being met? 
He will meet our needs according to his riches in glory. So if he's not meeting our needs, what is happening? Either we have stepped out of the grace flow or he has pulled back to minimize that grace flow so that we are being challenged, disciplined, and hopefully changed in some way. Okay, so in every one of these, we have to go before the Lord and say, what would you have me learn? Okay, if he's a father who's disciplining us because he loves us, there's something that we can learn in each of these scenarios. We might learn to be less part of the strife. We might learn to just stand back and go, I'm not playing that game. We might separate ourselves from difficult people or we may learn to accept them warts and all and just stop letting them get under our skin, right? Um, what about spiritual warfare? Like Jackie was talking about. What's the solution? Jesus has already taught us the solution. Are we putting it into practice? What is the solution? Prayer. You stand in the authority that Jesus Christ has given you to tell the enemy to step back, stand down, render him inoperable, impotent, quiet in the name of Jesus. You have that power and authority. We forget to use it. Okay? In fact, in all these situations, if it's the enemy at work against us because of something we've done, we need to take authority over that. If we're sleepless at night, what can we do about that besides taking a sleeping pill? Pray. pray. If you pray, you will fall asleep. What? Don't read your Bible. The world will put you to sleep. That's right. Read the Bible, pray, ask God to relax you, ask God to let that fall upon you. You don't know how many times I fall asleep praying because it brings peace, it brings calm, okay? If I wake up in the middle of the night at three in the morning, I don't get up and stress over it going, oh my gosh, now I'm not asleep, I'm not going to get enough hours. I just say, Lord, why have you got me up? Pray about what woke you up. Yeah, what do you want me to pray about? Psalms work great. Psalms work great, yes, they do. We're going to talk about that too. Psalms work great to bring that place of peace. Okay, all of these, this is a very important thing because until we can do this, until we can accept correction and discipline, we will not grow. We are stuck. And if we're stuck, guess what happens? You start to go backwards. Okay, so that's a very, very important part of what we have to learn in order to start truly mirroring Christ. Now, Jesus did not need correction because he was without sin, right? But even Jesus went to the desert and was tempted in the same ways that we are tempted. But what did he do? He, he quoted scripture back at the devil. He did not bow down to those temptations. He did not give in to the enemy's schemes. Instead, he depended on the Father to pour out into him and remind him of the truths that he needed to walk in in order to walk in that perfection. We can do the same thing. Now, we will never reach perfection in this lifetime, but we can start to reflect Christ more and more and more as we lean upon the word, lean upon, upon the authority that we've been given and trust the discipline that's coming upon us and saying, what can I take from this that's good? Because if he's allowing it, He's allowing it for our good. That's hard to believe sometimes. Believe me, I know. I've been poor, and I've been wealthy, and I've been everywhere in between, okay? And each of those have their own set of problems, okay? So, trust the discipline. Um, all right, now moving on to mirroring Christ. Uh, turn with me to Isaiah 61, we're going to read verses 1 through 3. And I picked this because Jesus himself quoted this passage in describing his ministry. So if we're going to describe our ministry of looking like Christ, mirroring Christ, should we not be doing the same things he did? Sure. Yes. Okay. In case you didn't know the answer to that, the answer is yes. Okay. <laughs> so, so, um, chapter... 61, verse 1, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord, the Holy Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. What's the good news? The gospel, right? He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted. Who are the brokenhearted? 
those who are grieving, those who are sick, those who are sleepless, in strife, stressed. Okay, all these people we just named, right? To proclaim freedom for the captives. What captives? Spiritual captives, okay? Yes, it could be prisoners, like literal prisoners, but it also is about being a spiritual prisoner that we can deliver people from their captivity, including ourselves that can be delivered from captivity, okay? Why? Because we have that authority that Christ gives us to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners, okay? We can rescue people from their imprisonment to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God. We know the final judgment will come, right? To comfort all who mourn. We don't do enough comforting, in my opinion, for those who are mourning. We pay our respects. We go to a funeral. We might say, how are you doing a week later? And then, boom, it's kind of forgotten, isn't it? And yet, people who grieve usually grieve for quite a period of time, anywhere from six months to three years, you know, or more. And so, we need to be aware when people are sorrowful or grieving that we are bringing them the comfort that they need. And I'm not saying to coddle somebody. I'm saying we comfort each other with the truth of God's Word and the love that can be demonstrated through that power of the Holy Spirit that says, I've been comforted by these things, and I want to share that with you. Pez dispenser, back to that, okay? To comfort all who mourn and provide for those who grieve in Zion, to bestow on them a crown of beauty instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, and a garment of praise instead of a spirit of despair. That's encouragement. We're supposed to be encouraging one another. They will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord for the display of his splendor. Okay, so if we're going to mirror Christ, we have to display his splendor. Now, how do we do that? Do what? Act as he would act. Display, whoops, display his splendor. Okay, which means we act like Christ. We look like Christ. I'm not talking about a beard and robe. Huh? (laughs) All right, what else? What is his splendor? Compassion. Truth. What? Empathy. Empathy. Yeah, that goes along with compassion. Generosity. Generosity. Good. Praise. Praise. Oh, grace. Okay. Forgiveness. Mercy. And most of all, you love that, don't you? (laughs) Tossing the money changers out of the temple. Doesn't that go with truth? Let's see. What does that go with? Righteous indignation. (laughs) Make sure it's righteous, though. Patrick always points this one out. Okay. Ultimately, though, the greatest command is love God and love each other, and Christ was perfect at that. So all of this works to display his splendor or mirror his image to others, right? Now, the question is, from there, how do we get to that place? Well, first of all, he gets us to that place because he's declaring here that we will be called oaks of righteousness, a planting of the Lord. What happens to a small sapling when the wind and the rain comes against it and blows it? It what? It bends. It bends, okay. It can be uprooted. It can be uprooted, right? Depending on the force of the wind and the depth of the roots. 
Okay, so we don't want to be blown about with the wind. James talks about that in the water, not being blown about with, with every wind of change. Okay, we don't want our roots to be so shallow, our roots in the word, our roots in Christ to be so shallow that we're easily uprooted. Instead, we have to get those roots down deep in the soil through the reading of his word, worship, prayer, all the things we've been talking about and growing stronger. When those roots go deep, what happens when the wind comes? It still stands because the roots hold on. If the tree still stands, what happens? It becomes bigger and more visible and stronger and therefore immovable. That's what we have to become in Christ, these oaks of righteousness that are not easily tossed about or uprooted, but instead we are immovable from our faith and yet constantly growing in that faith. As we grow as oaks of righteousness, what happens to the limbs? They branch out wider and wider and the foliage becomes heavier and heavier so that it covers what? More ground, okay? You're covering more of the kingdom. You're covering those saplings underneath you. You're covering those who are underneath your care. So as leaders, we want to be oaks of righteousness always. And if we're not, if you feel like you're a sapling, what do you got to do about it? Got to work on it. Got to be purposeful about working on it. You can't just go, hmm, oh, okay, whatever, maybe when I have time. Okay, so oaks of righteousness are part of the display of his splendor because where does that strength of the oak come from? Being rooted in Christ, right? Rooted in faith in who Christ was and what he did. Okay, so then we begin to mirror. We're not easily uprooted. Now, the Bible says that already as we grow, we should be producing good fruit, right? That's part of taking care of the kingdom that we're caring for. But it says already the axe is at the base. Matthew 3.10 says the axe is already at the root of the trees so that every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. So there's your question. Am I doing what God desires? Am I growing and am I producing good fruit? Okay. Another one of those tests of self-evaluation. Okay. And if we're not, guess what? God's going to bring more diversity because he's going, you're not meeting what I know you can meet. He pulls us out of our comfort zone but he also lets us know that we're not progressing, okay? We're stuck. We're just a measly little skinny tree. And he's going, I want you to be a mighty oak of righteousness, okay? Now, when we become closer to this, we have a duty for these underneath our branches. What would that duty be? Protect, okay? You want to protect others. What happens when our tree gets so old that it rots and dies? It feeds the other trees. It feeds the other trees. Good. Feed. Feed others. All right. But now we have no shade because my tree fell over and died. Now what's going to take care of the people? Their roots. Their roots. Yes. Their tree. And so as we feed others, this is really about mentoring, purposeful mentoring. And this is something we don't think a lot or don't think enough about at times. As leaders, we should always be mentoring at least one person, if not several. Jesus mentored how many people at one time? At least a dozen, yes. And in mentoring them, what was he preparing them to do? Spread the word, carry on after he was gone. That's the whole point. Each one of us as leaders should be mentoring someone to replace us or even better, okay? So we should be teaching and also exampling, demonstrating what it means to follow and mirror Christ. 
if we're not doing that, then we're not meeting the fulfillment of the scriptures as God has put it before us uh, as leaders. Turn with me to Titus chapter 2. I'll give you a minute because that one's hard to find. It's right after Timothy. Titus chapter 2, verses 1 through 9. You must teach what is in accord with sound doctrine. Well, we already see a problem there in our denomination. Teach the older men, <clears throat> Jimmy, to be temperate. <laughs> he didn't like that. <laughs> I know, right? Teach Jimmy to be temperate, worthy of respect, self-controlled, and sound in faith, in love, and in endurance. Likewise, teach the older women to be reverent in the way they live, not to be slanderers or addicted to much wine, but to teach what is good. Then they can train the younger women to love their husbands and children, to be self-controlled and pure, to be busy at home, to be kind, and to be subject to their husbands, uh so that no one will malign the word of God. How do we malign the word of God by not living up to those things that he just described? People see us. People see us. They're watching. If you think nobody's watching you as a leader or that you kind of escape under the radar every week because you just slip out of here right after church or you slip in at the last minute, think again. Somebody is watching you all the time, and they are assessing. We're going to get to that further in a minute. Go on to verse 6. Similarly, encourage the young men to be self-controlled in everything Set them an example so we don't always turn over the tables, just occasionally, right? (laughs) Uh, In everything, set them an example by doing what is good. In your teaching, show integrity, seriousness, and soundness of speech that cannot be condemned so that those who oppose you may be ashamed because they have nothing bad to say about us. Teach slaves to be subject to their masters in everything, to try to please them. Now, we don't really have slaves, but think of this as servants, okay? Not to talk back, to not to steal, but to show that they can be fully trusted so that in every way they will make the teaching about God, our Savior, attractive. Now, what stands out here as a mentoring goal? What what does the mentoring look like according to this passage? Teaching. Okay, there's several words here. Teach. What else? Example. Example, yes. This one may be even more important than this one because people don't care what you say. They care what you do. Integrity. That, that smacks right into the integrity thing. If you say one thing and do another, you're not a person of integrity. And people will question your leadership and whether what you have to say is valid or worthwhile. Okay, what else do you see here? Encourage. Encourage. Show, which is the same as example. But show has to do with action and demeanor and attitude. What's the anything else there? Anything else you see? Serious. It's okay to have a sense of humor, but sometimes you just got to be serious enough to go, this matters. What else? Be trusted. Trustworthy, truthful. Yeah. Pure. If they can't find anything wrong with you, then anything that they say negative is on them, right? Um, I like this last word in this passage. 
Everything that we do should be attractive. Why does that mean that we look pretty? Inviting. We want to bring people in. What? The ripple effect. Yes. You want people to want to follow you. To be a good leader, to be a good mentor, you've got to create an environment where people want to follow you. They want to hear you. They want to do what you do or at least look like you as far as your integrity and your character and those kinds of things. So this is what the mentoring, this is one of the most important things that we do as leaders. It should be. And like I said, sooner or later, one of us is going to get too old, too sick, too dead, whatever it might be, (laughs) that we need a replacement already waiting in line to fill our shoes, right? And so our role is to be leading those people, building more leaders. We lead to teach people to lead. All right. In other words, we've been talking about get over yourself. Well, now the key word for this week is replace yourself. Yeah. It's hard sometimes because you don't want to give up your baby. It's like, I worked hard for this. I don't want to give up my office. I don't want to give up my title. I don't want to give up my class. I don't want to give up whatever. And we got to get over that and say, let me replace myself. Make room for someone else to grow and lead. All right, so this is all the things that we're doing. It is our example. Like I said, we got to keep in mind as leaders that someone is always watching and they're always talking about what they see or what they surmise. If you think that people aren't talking about you, you're wrong. wrong. Absolutely. The question is, are they talking good about you, or are they talking smack talk about you? Okay? So we want to make sure that if somebody's talking smack, that God's going to bring conviction upon them because we should be doing such good that, that when they talk bad about us, as the passage says, that it's on them, that they are the ones that are being corrected or rebuked. In fact, it goes on to say um, in 1 Timothy 3, verses 2 through 11, if you want to turn there, short passage again. It says, now the overseer slash leader must be above reproach. The husband of what one wife, temperate, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not given in drunkenness, not violent. This is the same things we've been saying. Gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must, I would say he or she, because the real word there for overseer is presbytois, which is a genderless or both gender word that means uh, spouse or servant. Okay. It can be male or female. It's just, this is old interpretations. He must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him with proper respect. If anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? Well, ouch, he must not be a recent convert or he may become conceited and fall under the same judgment as the devil. Why? Because he'll become prideful. He must also have a good reputation with outsiders so that he will not fall into disgrace and into the devil's trap. Deacons, likewise, are to be men worthy of respect, sincere, not indulging in too much wine and not pursuing dishonest gain. They must keep hold of deep truths of the faith and clear conscience. They must first be tested And then if there's nothing against them, let them serve as deacons slash leaders. In the same way, their wives or spouses are to be spouses worthy of respect, not malicious talkers, but temperate and trustworthy in everything. Okay, so what did we see? The same examples, again, for those who, as leaders, what we're supposed to be so that we're teaching somebody else to be the same, right? Now, if somebody watched you today and how you responded and how you reacted to each little situation of the day, what would they have learned about you? What could they say about you? What? That I ain't got it 
I ain't got it together, okay? That's fair. Thank you for being honest. Uh, would they say you're temperamental? Would they say you're too high strong? Would they say you're emotional? Would they say you're a liar? Would they say you're a hypocrite? <laughs> Would they say you're swayed by the person you sat next to? <laughs> or vice versa? I mean, these are things, seriously, that we as leaders have to be conscious and go, what am I demonstrating to anybody who can see me? What are they interpreting from what they see? Now, we all fall into sin. We all make mistakes, right? So what do we do in those times? Somebody might see us... Like, they might see me ragging Elizabeth in the kitchen and think, man, she's mean to her. Okay? She's not very nice. Okay? But they might not know that we banter and that's just kidding and that's like a love language, right? And so what do I do? I got to make sure that they understand this is joking, this is kidding, this is love language, this is not how I really feel about her. Okay? Um, when Patrick turns over that table... Because of unrighteousness, what's somebody else going to think about him? He doesn't have self-control. Self He's high-tempered. What else? He, likes to flip over tables. he loves to flip over tables. <laughs> loves to make a mess. Okay. <laughs> what else? Chaotic. Flashy. Flashy. Making, a lot of noise. Making a lot of noise. Okay. Passionate. Hopefully, hopefully, hopefully they would see the passion. <laughs> That's why you love your older brother, right? <laughs> comes to your defense, right? We all should come to each other's defense if we hear somebody being maligned or gossiped about or talked about in a way that is not true or a way that is detrimental to the good of the whole, okay? This is part of our role as mentors. As we hear people talk, it is incumbent upon us to make sure that they understand what is true and to make sure that if we have fallen or we have failed in our witness that day, that we, number one, will own it. Okay, no, you got to own it before you repent. Okay, own your junk. They do go in tandem. Yeah, you're not going to repent if you won't even acknowledge that it's there. Okay? Yeah. So you want to own your junk knowing we're all going to fail. We are all going to fail. Hopefully we fail less and less at lesser and less degree, but we are all going to fail. So own it. Own your junk. You can't make cheesecake? Okay. <laughs> It was good. It tasted good. <laughs> All right. Now, if we're going to own our junk, what do we do? We got to first confess to God and maybe to somebody else. We got to repent. What else? Yeah. Yeah, we got to learn from it. Can't just, no, can't just accept it. <laughs> and you got to grow. No, in fact, I'm glad you said that about accepting it because there's so many people I hear that just when somebody tells them something, that's just who I am. That's just the way I am. Like me or love me, that's just who I am. God made me that way. Okay, no, God didn't make you that way. The devil made you that way. And, okay, we're not allowed to stay where we are. We're always supposed to be being changed and transformed into the likeness of Christ. So it's not just who you are. It's who you are that needs to change. Okay? And the only way that's going to happen is going through this process that we've been talking about. Now, what if somebody says something bad about Elizabeth? She makes rotten cheesecake. Okay, no, it's not fair. Okay, now, 
Should she go and prove that they're wrong? Should she defend herself and say, but you don't understand, it got stuck in the pan and it wouldn't come out? And like, uh, No. What should she do? One, hope that one of us as leaders would defend her, okay? But number two, and most importantly, is trust that God will defend her. God's got your back. That's right. Trust God to defend, okay, because he is our vindicator. He is our advocate. So when the accuser, Satan, and all his human instruments come against us, that we have the advocate that stands in the gap. We have the one who will vindicate us. Jesus did not defend himself before his accusers, did he? He let God vindicate him. He trusted God to vindicate him. And how did he vindicate him? Raising him from the dead, dead. exactly. So you may be raising from the dead before you feel vindicated. That's okay. Trust that God knows the truth. All kinds of psalms talks about God being our vindicator and our our advocate. In fact, Psalm 37, 6 says, but to trust God to advocate for you if people speak falsely about you. Okay? Now, what about this person that's talking all this ugly stuff about you? What's supposed to happen to them? Got to pray for them. If you're the one being Persecuted. persecuted, thank you, then you've got to pray for that person that they will see the truth, okay? And as leaders, if we hear that going on, we should be stepping in and going to that person to restore them to righteousness and truth, okay? Humbly, but firmly, quietly, lovingly, individually, not publicly necessarily, especially not in the beginning, Okay, we have to be those, as Galatians 6 tells us, to restore the sinful brother or sister. Okay, but bottom line, as the leader, you defend each other. Don't worry about defending yourself, really. I mean, I've tried to do that. It usually comes back and slaps me in the face. When I trust God to do it, it always works out. Okay. So, uh, and I'm not saying you don't ever confront somebody. I'm just saying when somebody has set upon their, their hearts and their minds that they don't like you and they're just talking bad about you all the time, don't worry about it. You know, they're looking for something and that's on them. Now, we will fail. Own it, confess, learn from it, grow from it so that your oak of righteousness gets bigger and better. And then lastly, as we wrap up the night... As you do that, what does that failure do for you? Yes. We always want to fail forward. It's not so much that we fail, it's what we do when we fail. Because as leaders, we will fail. We do fail. Don't deny it. Don't hide it. Just confess it. And fail forward. What am I going to do with that failure? I'm going to give it to God. Ask him by his grace and mercy to change me, to help me, to strengthen me, to prepare me. I'm going to pray and I'm going to trust him for the outcome. I'm going to trust him to be my advocate. I'm going to trust him to vindicate me. I'm going to trust him to give me what I need to do better the next time. So that I'm always going forward rather than backward, or sometimes even worse, to fail and quit. How many of you ever wanted to quit? Every day, (laughs) especially when you're doing cheesecake, right? Um, Most of us at one point or another just kind of want to quit, give up, throw up our hands, not worth it, too painful, too difficult, unappreciated, taken for granted, whatever it might be. And we want to quit, but God doesn't allow us to quit. He says, take that hardship, like we were talking about, let it strengthen you, discipline you, so that you become stronger, better, more equipped, and a better leader. Amen? Amen. Any questions? Because I'm done.
and I'm only five minutes over. <laughs> Thoughts, questions, comments, arguments. It is the truth, because I got every bit of it from Scripture. That's why we read so much Scripture. All right. Well, thank you all for being faithful to attend and participate. And uh, let me see if I can get that in the mail to you. (laughs) A certificate of completion. Okay. All right. Thanks for real. I appreciate it. And it was fun to be with you guys like this. So, all right, let's pray. Father, we do thank you for all that you've provided through your word. And Father, if any of this sinks in, then we thank you and give you praise because Lord God, every nugget will help to make us stronger, to turn our hearts to you, to come, become closer to you and therefore more greatly empowered by you to accomplish your kingdom's purpose to bring you glory and honor as you deserve, as you created us to do. And so, Father, we pray that we will hold on to the nuggets, that we will hold on to the scripture, and, Father, that we would go back to it often in order to be reminded of where our strength comes from, to be reminded of our purpose, and to be reminded of our failures and how to overcome. We thank you, Lord, that we are more than conquerors in Christ Jesus. And we thank you not only for the gift of life that he has given us, but the power of the Holy Spirit that dwells within us to strengthen us, encourage us, counsel us, and direct our paths. Let us be obedient to what the Spirit is saying. And let us be those vessels through whom you are pleased to work and minister, to dwell, and to pour out. Lord, uh, Pez Dispenser doesn't even begin to acknowledge what you pour forth in us and through us if we allow it. And so, Lord, just let us be mindful that we are those dispensers of love and truth. And, Father, more importantly, that we live to glorify you, that we live to be deeply in love with you, deeply in relationship with you. And, Father, just challenge us every day to go deeper so that we may be um, vessels the mirror of Christ, the identity and example of Christ to those whom we care for in the body. We thank you. We love you. Protect us and keep us as we go forth. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right. I'm kind of sad.